really all I needed. Sorry. Don't roll the tape yet. <laughs> Jody, how did you meet Travis? And when? Um, we met at the Rainforest Cafe in um, the MGM Grand in, in Las Vegas. How long ago was that? It was in September of 2006. What was it about him when you saw him that kind of drew you to him? You know, there wasn't really any initial magnetic attraction. Um, at the time, I shook his hand. He said, hi, I'm Travis. I said, hi, I'm Jody. And his, his name was just another of, of many names that I had to remember. I was meeting hundreds of people that weekend. Um, we were all there for a, a big convention. And so um, it was right after I had finished eating with a group of people and we got up and shook hands with a few people. He was among them. And then we began to walk throughout the casino. And he made it a point to keep walking next to me and keep me engaged in conversation. And we just, you know, by the time we made it around to the big gold line in the front of the lobby, we just, we had discovered a couple of common interests and that sort of thing. How did your friendship to develop more? Um, well, we, um, we hung out throughout the weekend, had a lot of fun. Um, exchange phone numbers, and it was one of those things where I didn't expect him to call. Um, but he called me the very next day, and so I was like, oh, hi, and, you know, we just, he, he's a good conversationalist. He just kept me in, engaged in conversation constantly, and, you know, he wanted to know about me, and people like to talk about themselves, so, you know, it was just one thing led to another, and we became great friends. Did you two work together? Um, we worked together on occasion. We were with the same company, but we sort of worked in different departments. Is that how so you two met at the same? Um, yes, we went. We met at, at a convention where our company was. You mentioned that you guys love to travel together. Tell me a little bit about where you traveled. We traveled to, um, the first major place we traveled to was the Grand Canyon. Um, we went there on a few occasions, Havasu Pai, uh, with some friends, and we went to Sedona. Um, we went all over New Mexico. We saw the Carlsbad Caverns, we saw Roswell, we saw um, the Balloon Fiesta. We, we went to a, a spa that was kind of renowned in Santa Fe. Why was he a good traveling companion? Oh, he was a great traveling companion for many reasons. Um, traveling with Travis was kind of like traveling with your own personal comedian <laughs> and, or serenader um, or philosopher. He always you know, had great things to talk about that would, that would make you think and he was always bursting out in the song and um, he was a very funny guy so there were never there was never a shortage of laughs and so and he was just a great person to travel with he had an enthusiasm and a lust for life that uh, you know we always wanted to see what was around the next corner and so I, I, I think that was something that um, we both shared can you talk a little bit about your faith I know you had mentioned in the previous interview that he actually baptized you uh, he did what yeah that? the reason um, when a person is, is baptized into the church, they, they generally are able to choose the person they'd like to baptize them. And the reason I chose Travis was because he was very instrumental in, in, in bringing me into the church. And he was the first person to share the gospel with me and, and, and give me a copy of the Book of Mormon. And he challenged me to read it, and, and I did. And, and um, you know, it was a decision that I made. And, and I could tell he was very honored when I asked him. And, and he, you know, of course, was, was happy to do so. so. Baptizing, I think, is, is a is a is a really, is, it's a sacred um, thing. How did your friendship grow into this relationship that you shared? Um, we just continued. To, we lived. I lived in Palm Desert, California. He lived in Mesa. So our our friendship was really over the phone every night. You know, when all was said and done, um, when his day's work was done and my day's work was done, that you know he would inevitably call and. And we would talk for a while, anywhere from, you know, half hour, or it was sometimes it would end up being four hours, and then we'd fall asleep, and, and things like that. Um, and then, you know, with time, it just kind of progressed into a little bit more and a little bit more and, until we decided to make it more official. And then you two actually ended up moving in together, didn't you? No, we never lived together, actually. Um, I spent a lot of time in his house, and um, we spent a lot of time traveling. Um, but, you know, he, he had all male roommates. <laughs> Okay. okay. Um, I must agree. Tell us about Travis's faith. Um, Travis is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, he became more active in that ch in, in in the church when he was about 16 years old, and um, you know he he was he told me that you know he began to. Um, really began to question things and that's when you know when, when he prayed about it that's when he knew that that's that was the path that he wanted to take in his life and and he was determined to go on a mission and, and that sort of thing you admired that in him didn't you um i admired that because yeah he he was a very determined person when he set his mind to something he set out to achieve it i'm a little bit more of a procrastinator 
Um, he would live his life by lists and uh, he really enjoyed checking those off. It gave him a sense of accomplishment and I think it really kept him focused. And he tended to accomplish more in one day than some people do in a month. Um, so, you know, one day it would be, um, I, I think I want to paint this room, and, and I would come over the next day and it was painted. You know, he wouldn't put things off. You mentioned that you really respected his opinion. I did. Yeah, especially when it came to um, um, just knowledge of the gospel, things like that. Um, all of that, all, all of the resources that one needs can be found on a website like LDS.org. Um, but he kind of gave me a more personal perspective on things. There were some questions where I just was like, why? Why this? Why this? And, and he was able to answer those. Were you in love with Travis? Um, I think that being in love and, and loving someone are two different things. And there was a point in time where we were in love, but it was short-lived. Why did you guys break up? Um, there was sort of a breach of trust in our relationship. On your part or his part? Both. You guys couldn't move past it? Um, no, not, we really couldn't move past it, um, and... But you guys managed to keep dating. We didn't date, per se, we just hung out. Or you, was it separate interests? Were you interested in different people? Who was interested in different people? How did you... Um, there was, yeah, um, we did eventually move on in that, in that regard, and I think that it was hard to fully move on, I think, because we continued to spend a little bit too much time together on occasion. Um, but, yeah, we did. So from the time you met and the time you developed this friendship into a relationship, how long were you guys together as a couple? I'd say a period of five months. And how it was, was you know, I'm sorry. It's a period of five months. And talk to us about those five months. What were those five months like? They were a lot of fun. Um, you know, there was, a, there was a sense of uncertainty at times, and there was a sense of excitement, and there was an excitement about the future, and, and we, we just had a lot of fun together, and um, it was one of those things where it was very fun while it lasted, and um, when we decided to break things off and become just friends, we, we continued to be friends, and, and that's just how it went. Was there jealousy on the part of um, both of you guys? Or? I would say... On my end, not so much jealousy, maybe a sense of insecurity, but that's just me. Um, on his end, sometimes, um, I don't think it was warranted, but I took it as a compliment. <laughs> I was reading, um, I think it might have been his last note to you, May 1st this year, and it said, you know, you're one of the hottest people he knew, and you must be making your town a lot hotter for being Oh, there. yeah, he said the, um, he said the, the hot quota or status or I don't remember what he said. He made some comment. Yeah. Did he bring you up a lot? Um. I don't know. I, did he was he able to bring your spirits up? I mean. Oh yeah yeah yeah. He was very uplifting. Very uplifting person. Um. He he had every he knew every one of my buttons. He could bring me up or down. You know, at the drop of a hat. Um. But mostly he brought me up. Were and there just, problems with, with with the problems in your relationship in those five months? Start pretty much immediately or was it three months into it or kind of um, help us was, understand that? It was pretty much our relationship um, it was just an average I don't want to say average I, nothing is average with Travis um, but any problems that we had they they occurred really right toward the end and, and that signaled the end of our relationship it's nothing that we continue to dwell on and try to work out. What Which was I, the one thing that finally you said this is it or um, he said it? It was it was just a breach of trust. I really don't remember the day at all. I just remember when I got the phone call, um, and it was late, 10.30, I think. Who called you? A mutual friend of ours. And what did he or she say? He didn't say much. He, he didn't know much. And um, he just said, something has happened, and I don't have a lot of details. And um, I said, well, what can you tell me? And he, again, I just don't have a lot of details. And I thought, well, maybe it's a mistake. Are you sure? And he said, um, I'll let you know when I know more, but you're the first person I thought to call. What was going through your mind? Um, it, was a, it was a shock, a feeling of shock and a sort of disbelief. And, and there wasn't, it was a real restlessness because I didn't know. And I felt, I don't know, it, it, you just don't know until I actually got confirmation of what had happened. It, that's when things really began to, to sink in. What did you do at that point once you got more information? What did you do? Um, it was over the phone, and so I just remained as calm as possible, and, well, I, I, 
it got confirmation from his bishop, who actually confirmed it. And um, at that point, it, it was just about me holding it together over the phone and, and crying as silently as possible while he told me what he knew. And then I hung up with him and... and were you here in town or were you... I was in Wairica, California. California. When was the last time that you saw Travis? Um, it was sometime in early June. How far before his death do you remember? Um, I don't remember exactly, but it was very close to. There were, um, you were mentioning in the interview before this, the pictures that were found and recovered of the two of you. You were mentioning what was on those pictures. The detective did show you one. Can you explain um, he, it, well, it's not, it's, it's all public information, but it's nothing that I'm really comfortable talking about. Um, and it's nothing that he nor I ever intended to be made public. It's something that we intended to keep private. Um, but now that all of this has been thrust under a microscope, everybody knows about it. So part of it, part of me says, why bother trying to skirt around the issue? Um, and another part of me says, um, you know, have a little discretion. Um, but again, it, it's public information and they're just photos that we took and um, that we deleted with the intention of it. And it, it, that, wasn't, that wasn't a one-time incident. I mean, there were many times where, you know. You took pictures. Yeah, yeah. pictures, whatever, and, and any kind of media. And, and it was deleted because it's just, it's just something that we didn't intend to ever keep. Can you talk about some of the, your love for photography and just uh, in general the type of photography that you did? Yeah, um, I've loved photography since, since I can remember, since I got my first camera. Um, I've taken pictures of everything you could think of, and I think what I really began to enjoy and settle in on was, was people. Um, I really enjoy um, nature and sunsets, but people and, and their expressions. Um, moments, especially weddings, when you know you can just you can just see expressions on people's faces and, and emotional moments. I, I love capturing that sort of thing. Jody, why do you think investigators believe that you killed Travis? Um, well, there's a lot of forensics suggesting that I was, um, you know, in his house. Um, of the evidence that they pre presented to me. Um, I was asked the question, if you were presented this evidence and you were a third party, what would you think? And, um, you know, I, I need to be honest in it, the evidence is very compelling, but none of it proves that I committed a murder. None of it proves that I committed a crime. Um, what it does substantiate is what I did tell detectives. Did you, I have to ask you this, did you kill Travis Hall? Absolutely not. No, I had no part in it. Did he have any enemies at all? To my knowledge, no. He was a he had a strong personality, um, but he was very well liked and loved. Um, I, I just can't think of a single soul. So you had nothing to do with Travis Alexander's death. This ever nothing to do with it. To know that he was stabbed some twenty-seven times and shot once in the left cheek. What? Who could have done this to him? Who do you think killed him? I have no idea. Do you think that it was a random thing or somebody that knew him? I mean, this is a guy that you were pretty close to. Um, it, this was a guy I was close to at a time when we were really trying right. to move apart from each other. So, I mean, there were certain details about his life that, that I never did know about. And there were even more details that I, I knew, did not know about, as, as well as details about my life that he didn't know about. Because I had moved on, I had moved to California, um, so we were making a sincere effort to grow apart and to be apart and to move on. Um, but nonetheless, he did remain a close friend of mine, um, and I, I just can't make it. In police reports um, from the Mesa Police Department, it states that some of his family and his friends told detectives that you had become obsessed with Travis. Is that true? His family and friends said that? According to the police yes. report. The police report. Oh, well, I think that um, I've only met his grandmother, so I don't think uh, that's accurate at all for his family to say. Um, but I think that if I were in their shoes, I would be going very much off of what police were telling me. Um, I, 
don't, I wouldn't use obsession. I would say, um, um, I don't know. I think that it, that when more evidence comes out, it'll be very telling that, that it was a two-way street. And, um, and Travis was a wonderful person, but he was also very persuasive and he was hard to say no to. And it was hard. You know, he, he wouldn't allow me to um, not answer his text message. Um, if I didn't respond, he would keep calling and keep calling until I did. And so um, to me, that wasn't obsessive behavior on his part. It was just, I took it as a compliment. And if he wanted to talk to me, okay, that's great. Um, but were you obsessed with him? Is, or those are the allegations they make? No, no, not at all. Jody, you're pretty calm sitting here. Somebody who's been arrested and accused of murdering somebody, how are you managing to stay so calm? Through my faith and through the knowledge of my own innocence. That's the only thing. Um, I would be shaking in my boots right now if, if I had to answer to God for such a heinous crime. Um, but I'm very grateful that, that this is one thing that I will never have to answer to when I sit, when I stand or sit, uh, when I'm before the judgment seat someday. And uh, all of my actions, my thoughts, my words, the things I've done and said are called into account. Um, you know, this is not one, one of those things that will be, that will be brought up. Um, it, it, I've done many things that, that are shameful, um, but this is not one of them. Did you have a gun? Did Travis have a gun? Um, to my knowledge, there, it was like a, a 25 caliber gun. Um, I did own a gun. It was a 9 millimeter though and uh, it had never been fired. It was a brand new gun. But when my freedom is taken away for, for something that I didn't do, uh, that's difficult to accept. And when I think of the ones who are capable of doing this, um, you know, I like to think that I could be the bigger person and, you know, what I believe, and, and this is um, something that um, comes from my faith, uh, my religion, is that it's commanded of us to forgive all people um, and I don't know that I would be big enough to stand before the person who did this and say, I forgive you. Um, I don't think I'm ready for that by any means, but I think that one day I'll reach that point as I grow and develop. But to know that this report is basically pointing all blame to you, it's as if police have stopped investigating anyone else. Yeah, and that really bothers me. Do you think um, you're being set up or framed or anything? I can't think of, of any enemies that I might have that would want to do that. Um, I think, no, I don't think that. Was the relationship ever violent? Um, pass on that question. You yourself said that some of the evidence that investigators have is damning. Is, you know, how are you able, how are you going to move past that? How are you going to get beyond this and prove your innocence? Um, that's... Just, uh, that's, that's a defense strategy that we'll have to work out. Why did you want to speak out today? Um, I kind of feel like since I've been incarcerated, it's, it's almost like there's been a proverbial duct tape over my mouth, and, and um, I haven't been able to say anything. Um, there have been a, a lot of people that have been speaking um, out and, and saying things um, you know, on their side. And there isn't, this isn't a, this isn't a two-sided story. This is a multifaceted story. Um, there are many sides to this story. Um, and I just don't feel like mine has been represented. Why do you think family and friends started pointing the finger at you? Um, I don't know who did or said it first, but I know that it, um, some things were said because I was, I was on the road that week. Um, so it, you know, I think that because, you know, as much as Travis and I told ourselves and everyone that we were just friends, um, I think that our behavior was not as clandestine as we tried to make it. Um, so you know, there were times when people would see certain ways we would behave and, and maybe wonder. I, I know that he got, he lamented a lot that he got a lot of grief from his friends about um, the amount of time that we spent together. And, Did they not like you? Um, I don't know that it was so much that. I think they were more concerned with his um, future prospects for marriage and, and where his focus was. And his focus definitely was on that. Um, marriage is, you know, he viewed marriage as an important step in his, his spiritual progression. And I think he took it seriously, but, you know. This report says that your left palm print in blood was found on the wall. Your hair follicle was found on a blood wall. Um, there is an explanation.
explanation for that. And, um, you know, um, it, it will be made known very soon. Is there anything you would say to his friends or family? Anything you would say to them? So many things that I'd like to say to them, and I just I don't think that that they are they in any way would, would like to hear it, or that they're in any position to even want to receive it. Um, but I've said this before, and, and I'll continue to pray for this, and that is that I hope they can find peace.